Hello, I'm excited to present Dr. Michaela Toffer that is gonna be our keynote today on the in situ data analytics for next generation molecular dynamics workflows. Dr. Toffer is an ACM distinguished scientist and holds the Jack Dogar Professorship in HPC in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. She earned her undergraduate degrees in computer engineering from the University of Padova in Italy and her doctoral degree in computer science from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Switzerland. From 2003 to 2004, she was a La Jolla Interfaces in Science Training Program postdoctoral fellow at UCSD and the Scripps Research Institute, where she worked on interdisciplinary projects in computer systems and computational chemistry. Dr. Toffer has a long history of interdisciplinary work with scientists. Her research interests include software applications and their defense programmability and heterogeneous computing, multi-core platforms and GPUs, cloud computing, and volunteer computing, and performance analysis, modeling, and optimization of multi-scale applications. She has been serving as the principal investigator of several NSF collaborative projects. She also has significant experience in mentoring a diverse population of students on interdisciplinary research. Dr. Tafra's training expertise includes efforts to spread HPC participation in undergraduate education and research, as well as efforts to increase the interest and participation of diverse populations in interdisciplinary studies. Thank you, Dr. Tafra, for this presentation, and we are looking forward for it. I am very pleased to present the work of my group and my collaborators at the 15th Works Workshop. I also want to thank Ian, Rosa, and uh, Raphael for inviting me today to give this talk about in situ data analytics for next generation molecular dynamic workflows. This is collaborative research with Cornell University, University of New Mexico, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and the University of Southern California. The research I am presenting today was made possible by the hard work of many students, postdoctoral researchers, and collaborators that are presented here in these slides. We are also very grateful for the support of the National Science Foundation and IBM. I want to start my talk by looking at a trend in workflows that I'm sure uh, you uh, agree with me is quite a challenge in uh, workflows, workflow development, workflow uh, use. It is how this, our workflows are becoming more and more complex and heterogeneous. Once upon a time, workflow were predominantly about compute. Today, workflows are a combination of compute, analytics, and data. So here in this slide, you see an example of modern workflows is the workflow for LIGO. And as you see here, it, has been, it is supported by Pegasus and integrates the three important component, compute, analytic, and data. So while our workflows are becoming more and more complex, uh, we have also to consider what is going on in the high performance computing community. And there are two major trends that I would like to point out. The first one is about the widening gap between compute and IO on our supercomputers. So if you look at the picture on your left, you have here a representation uh, in terms of uh, peak um, petaflops and uh, also IO bandwidth for three generation of supercomputers at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Jaguar, Titan, and Summit. And the blue bar represents the peak flops, the red bars represent the peak uh, parallel file system IO bandwidth. And so clearly we see how this gap between uh, data production and data storage has been growing substantially, which means for us that on these platforms, we can generate more and more data, but we are also slower and slower in storing this data. The second trend I want to point out is about the transformation that our simulation are going through. Uh, once upon a time, we were looking at simulation that were few jobs, and the uh, challenge there was to uh, parallelize these jobs to take over 
as many nodes as possible. Now, if we look today at what kind of simulation we are running on our supercomputers, we see that we are moving towards what we call an ensemble of jobs. A user submits many, many jobs uh, and their combination is producing uh, scientific discovery. Here on your right, you have a picture that represents this trend on three key machines from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, and as you see, um, as uh, we move, as the time goes by, we move from purple to sequoia to sierra, uh, the number of jobs per user running simulation become larger and larger which means from a point of view of the scientist that the data are generated locally on individual nodes by individual jobs, but then we need somehow to gather together this knowledge into a global knowledge. So what does it mean collecting the information that is embedded into our simulations? Well, what does it mean today? It's related to how we run our simulations. So what we do traditionally is uh, uh, run very uh, efficiently our simulations on uh, supercomputers. And as we move for, through our simulation, we save our data to parallel file system. And here we cannot forget that this movement of data to the parallel file system is facing the challenge of the uh, IO bandwidth that is uh, becoming less and less supportive of data movements. Now, once the simulation is completed, uh, we move our data to a dedicated system on which we um, perform our analytic, but this takes place after the simulation has been completed. And so if there are new questions, if we discover that during our simulation there are spaces that we were exploring or we were not exploring and we need to understand better, then we need to go back, complete our cycle and repeat the simulation, creating this sequentiality of what is the uh, scientific discovery. Now, this is not ideal. What we would like to have is something like in the picture on your right, where we have that application, simulation, and analytic are taking place at the same time, and where we learn that there is an uh, interesting uh, aspect of the simulation as the simulation evolves, and we steer the simulation uh, to uh, indeed meet these requirements, explore new spaces, uh, understand new direction as the simulation itself is evolving. There is, for this, need for software packages and middleware that allow us to coordinate analytics and simulation. And indeed, we have that. Uh, there has been uh, important work that has been looking at aspect of augmenting our HPC system with uh, in situ and in transit analytics. Uh, two examples of these efforts are data spaces that is led by, Rod by Rodger University and DCAF, which is led by Argonne National Laboratory. What do this tool allow us? They allow us to run in situ simulation in which the resources dedicated for the simulation are co-shared by the analytic or in transit analytic in which we have nodes that are dedicated to simulation and analysis at the same time interconnected by powerful network interconnections and enabling in this case again in situ analysis and steering. A question that uh, it's uh, important is, which kind of application better fit uh, this uh, idea of uh, um, simulations and analytic at the same time, uh, term time? Well, perhaps the question should be formulated in terms of what kind of application are more uh, popular, more uh, used uh, on our supercomputers. 
And so to answer this question, I went back and look at the uh, top scientific fields that are using the EXCEED resources. The EXCEED uh, initiative is a National Science Foundation initiative, is supporting across the United States a, a cluster of ion uh, system supercomputers, and these uh, resources are made available to scientists for scientific discovery. So if we look at this picture here, you have a summary of the key fields. They are sorted based on CPU core hours uh, that are dedicated on exceed machines. And what we see here is that the majority of our application or our simulations are targeting fields in which there is aspect of uh, structural uh, biology, molecular structure, uh, chemistry, material science. And uh, so these are all fields that have been extensively uh, developed in the past uh, uh, from a computational point of view. As a matter of fact, if we look at this field and we look at the type of simulations that are executed, we see that there is a large spectrum of what we call a multi-scale computational environment in which we have uh, that the interaction between scale, time scale, and length scale is addressed uh, through a very robust an efficient uh, uh, software ecosystem, which is a computational software ecosystem. So um, here in these slides, you have this representation of the multi-scale uh, study and the type of study that are done in this context on your left, while on your right, you have a list of uh, uh, software uh, packages or direction uh, that cover these different scales and has been uh, developed by uh, scientists and computer scientists in the past uh, uh, several decades. So there is in particular one important type of simulations that is the target of this presentation. And it is very dear to me because uh, uh, of my interest, which is uh, the molecular dynamic simulations. Then uh, when we look at molecular dynamic simulations, it's quite a large spectrum of implementation. What we are targeting in this talk, uh, it's uh, what we call classical molecular dynamics simulation, where we are looking at aspect of uh, transformation of sequence of amino acids, um, and at their structural uh, transformation. Like in this case, where you have a sequence of amino acid and you are exploring the process of folding of that sequence into a ternary structure. And so what we see here is that this process is not a single job. It is an ensemble of hundreds of thousands of molecular dynamic jobs. And as we can also see, is that uh, some of these jobs are more um, relevant to identify the transformation pattern than other. Some uh, require to be terminated because there is not a real transformation. Some of them uh, can become very important and could become the starting point of uh, next molecular dynamic jobs. Each job itself is uh, performed through hundreds of thousands of steps of molecular dynamic steps. And so uh, when we look at the job individually, we see that it is an iterative process in which we have that uh, uh, we perform what we call molecular dynamic steps. And each step start by looking at the forces that uh, are impacting the atom. So forces on individual atoms, we have different types of forces, and we uh, use these forces, we add them to compute the acceleration of the atom. So we speak about a, a atom representation of the system, and we look at the acceleration of the atoms. The acceleration are used for velocity, computing the velocity of the atoms, and last uh, but not least, the velocity uh, 
are used to update the atom position. So iteratively, we go through this update of atom position, and every n steps, every certain number of stride, we have that we write in output a snapshot of uh, this simulation so that we have a representation of what is going inside what is going on inside the molecular dynamic jobs in terms of what we call a frame, a three-dimensional frame. And what is that we are looking for? We are collecting these frames that are collected every n strides or steps, and we create a movie, a trajectory. But what we are really interested in is to identify in this trajectory what we call rare events. There are many examples of rare events, events that don't happen uh, regularly, but are critical to understand what is the molecular uh, conformation. We have here two examples of rare events that are important for us. The first one is under the umbrella of transformations, in which we have that, like in this case, we have several beta sheets and they transform during the molecular dynamic jobs into uh, alpha helix, like in this case. Another type of rare event that is important in a trajectory is uh, an event in which we have, like in this case, uh, we have four alpha helix, and one of these alpha helix, the blue one, is having a dramatic rotation, a very uh, major change. And so that is another example of rare events that is relevant inside the job. So as the simulation evolves, we have that we collect trajectories, one trajectory per job. And what we have is that, like in this case, you have a very simple example of a trajectory, which you have frames that are collected every five steps. And we start with the sequence of amino acid, and we see that the structure is changing to the point in which we get a alpha helix that is stable. So the scientists want to understand what is going on during the simulation and want to see when this happens. So um, the traditional approach is indeed to run the simulation, store the trajectory, and then use visualization tool to look where and when this uh, change, this transformation, this rare event happened. Now, this is where is the weakness of our traditional simulations. This is where we want to intervene and we want to change the way in which we understand what is going on inside our molecular dynamics without disrupting the simulation, without moving the frame to a central file system, without comparing frame to each other, or without comparing frame from one job to another job. So all this movement of data are slowing down the scientific discovery. We want to do we want to do understand what is going on inside the simulation without indeed going through these movements of data. So you could say, well, we have a very powerful tool today, which is machine learning codes. And indeed, machine learning has been growing in importance uh, in many fields, including the molecular dynamics simulation, the study of molecular structures. However, I want to point out how we are sort of building a, a myth around the molecular dynamic codes, and we need sort of to redimension the role of molecular dynamic codes because they're only just a small component of something that is bigger, which is a data software ecosystem that allow us to indeed integrate analytic and compute with data playing a key role in the scientific discovery. Now, we are missing this data software ecosystem. Why do I say that? Well, because if we look at how we are still using our supercomputers, and this is a case for the exceed resources, we see that the majority of our time, like in this case, 
we have the service unit per hour uh, for the exceed resources in the past uh, uh, six months, we see that the majority of our resources are still predominantly used for compute and very little is classified and see as data intensive computer, which is the analytic part of a simulation. Indeed, we are missing the uh, data software ecosystem that once in place, allow us to enable in situ analytics. So this is the big challenge we have. Go back and revisit what is our workflow, what is our software platform, and not just consider that in terms of a molecular uh, or machine learning code or a set of machine learning codes, but in terms of a major data software ecosystem that support the molecular dynamic simulation. And what kind of support do we expect? Well, this is our simple trajectory. And so what we expect from our data software ecosystem, it's to enable us to look at the trajectory from a different point of view. As the trajectory evolves, as we uh, go through step of our molecular dynamic uh, job, we have frames. And what we want to do is that our software allow us to capture for every single individual frame, what we call collected variables. So set of statistical information or more sophisticated information that represent, become a metadata that capture what is going on inside each frame. So as the simulation evolves, as frames are generated, on individual frames, we extract with the support of our data software ecosystem, these collected variables. And at the end, we don't work any longer with visualization, but we work with collected variables that become proxy for the structural and conformational changes of my molecular dynamic simulation. So uh, if we look at the big picture, we have that uh, we have a simulation a molecular dynamic simulation that is running on our uh, supercomputers. Uh, it is using uh, any code, could be Gromax, Charm, and uh, we have this uh, output of frames to memory, every certain number of steps, every stride. And rather than re-engineering the code, rather than rewriting the molecular dynamic code to integrate the analysis, what we want to do is to extract or capture the frames that are written in memory and work from these frames into with, to create a, a plugin, to create a component that allow us to do the analytics. So the frame is generated, it's generated and is stored in memory, where we have staging areas supported, for example, from data spaces, and then it is moved to a module for the analysis that we can uh, adapt based on the type of analysis we are performing. And as these frames are generated, they are at the same time analyzed, and we extract from this frame, on each individual frame, we extract what we call the collected variable by using machine learning inferred algorithm. The new knowledge we collect, it's at runtime. And so we can use that even for giving back to the simulation feedbacks for steering the simulation to explore new spaces or perhaps to terminate some of the spaces, uh, the search in spaces that are no longer providing um, interesting result in terms of rare events. Now, one thing I want to point out here is that we are not re-engineering the molecular dynamic simulation. The molecular dynamic simulation and the code that support that come in its format, and we are complementing, building a complementary uh, framework uh, that support the analysis concurrently without changing the code. We, sort of leverage an important aspect of the molecular dynamic simulation, which is the fact that most code we are using 
uh, give in output frames that are in a standard format. So this is a plus and we are using Plumb as a plug-in software that allows us to capture the standard format for the frame and pass it to the analytic that take place at the same time concurrently. So I want to zoom in into uh, the analytic part. I said that it is a part that we can personalize, uh, make that specific for the type of simulation we are running, the type of science we are addressing in the context of classical molecular dynamic simulations. And so one question is, how do I represent the information? How do I transform a three-dimensional structure into something that is suitable for uh, further investigation, perhaps also with machine learning codes? And that is a key question uh, that it's important because if we look back at how we represent molecular structures, we see how they, this representation are very uh, intuitive for us, for the human being and for visualization, but their representation is not as suitable as it is for us when we deal with uh, these frameworks and these frames, and we are using machine learning for extracting uh, changes in the structure, in the molecular structure. The key question is what is the right format, the adequate format of a protein representation of a molecular structure representation so that it can be used to identify the rare events by machine learning codes. Certainly not the type of representation you see in these slides because they can cause uh, uh, occlusion we don't see some part of the protein structure. Uh, you have that you may lose ternary structures and definitely uh, they are not suitable for partial matching of substructures where rare events can take place. So our vision is to change this representation. It's to move from a uh, friendly representation for our uh, eyes to something that is friendly uh, for um, machine learning methods and uh, codes. And the type of representation we refer to is a, what we call a graphic encoding representation that as a two-dimensional component come with different intensity and different colors and all these aspects embed information about the structure for a specific frame. And how do we get there? How do we get to a representation of a protein like the one in the slides on your right that we call graphic encoding? Well, we go through uh, a set of steps, a uh, algorithm that take into account uh, aspect of the secondary and ternary uh, representation of the conformation. So here you have a snapshot of a protein, it's an HIV protease, and uh, uh, we want to capture the information that are embedded in the structure of this frame. How do we do that? Well, we go through uh, a uh, the coupling of the information through two steps. The first one is about uh, um, extracting secondary structure information using the Ramachandra plot. It is based on uh, the diadral angles of amino acid residual and identifying this angle allow us then to uh, know whether we are uh, dealing with a, a sequence of amino acids that are part of an alpha helix or they're part of uh, a uh, beta strands or are a, a complete third type of representation that called others. And uh, uh, so we have this classification into the three different types. The second part is about uh, establishing and expressing uh, the ternary structural information 
in other words, see how the secondary structure relate to each other. And we do that through uh, a distance metric between the different residuals in the protein. So we simplified uh, the uh, structures, the secondary structure, uh, and represent them in terms of their, uh, each amino acid is simplified with its carbon atoms. And then we build from that distance matrices. With this information, we can then merge this information and create three distinct channels. In the channel, we use colors to encode secondary structure that we just extrapolated from the Ramachandra plot, and use intensity to proportionally represent distances of alpha helix and beta strands, and other conformations, other structures. So for the color, we use red for the alpha helix, we use blue for the beta strand, and green for the other. The intensity, again, represents the uh, distances. And we perform on these three channels a resizing into what is our final encoding, and we do that by applying a bicubic interpolation. What we produce in output is a consistent in dimension image that uh, has the embedded information and can be used by machine learning to retrieve the information we are looking for. So let me show you a couple of examples. So this is uh, uh, a uh, MAC, uh, heavy chain is a combination of beta strands and alpha helix, and it is essential for the adaptive immune system. So as you see here, this is a snapshot, it's a frame, and what we want to represent is graphically, in a graph encoding, the relationship of the secondary structures uh, to respect to each other and their presence. So we build the three channels, and here we have a fourth channel for alpha helix and beta strand, uh, a second for beta strands and other conformations, secondary structure, and a third channel for alpha helix and the other conformation. And then we combine them and create what it is an encoded image that is equivalent to the original one that you have here on the top, uh, but has encrypted or encoded with colors and intensity of the color, the same information, and it's ready to be passed to a machine learning to identify, for example, uh, patterns and uh, rare events. So let me show you an example of that. So this is uh, a, uh, the opsin is a group of proteins that are uh, light sensitive, and they can be found in uh, the cell of our retina. And there is, here you have, it's a quite a complex protein meant as that is not just a couple of alpha helix. Uh, it has, it's, it's a long alpha helix. And so this is its uh, uh, encoded representation that it's been built with our um, algorithm. Now, the question is uh, how to use this for uh, scientific discovery. And so the attention is toward these two alpha helix structures and this connection that uh, what we know is uh, evolving and is causing an unfolding of the structure. So what we can do is to zoom in into the region of uh, the uh, initial encoding where this uh, interaction between th these two secondary structure uh, are uh, captured in our representation. And we do that by looking at different frames, so different times of our job, of our molecular dynamic job, and we visualize the, uh, the changes, the unfolding process through uh, our encoding uh, algorithm. And what we see here is that uh, as we move as the time goes by and our molecular dynamic job evolves, we have that progressively the yellow replace the red and that create, remember, red is synonymous of alpha helix and uh, 
yellow uh, is synonymous of others. And so in this case, we see how the others format, what is not alpha helix, is taking place and becoming predominantly, but presenting here the trend of the unfolding. What we have seen so far, it's uh, how to deal with uh, uh, extracting uh, knowledge from frame of a molecular dynamic jobs. And we were focusing on a single trajectory. Now we go back and see what is a molecular dynamic simulation. We said it's an ensemble of jobs. So how do we scale from local knowledge on a single node that we extract at runtime to an ensemble of uh, uh, informations that we extract from many jobs that are running concurrently. That is the next question. So indeed, this is what we have seen here. We have seen that we have uh, created a framework that allow us to extract at runtime information and we build on uh, the support of existing software like data spaces. And now the next challenge that our group is tackling is to move from one trajectory to many trajectory and from one type of analytics to many different type of analytics in which each is targeting a specific type, for example, of rare events uh, that may occur in our uh, jobs, and therefore we need to extract a different type of collective variables. So this is the challenge we are addressing that, and there are many potential applications for this uh, big picture, this big vision. First of all, it allows us to understand and annotate the trajectories. Uh, let's keep in mind that once we generate these frames, uh, we are analyzing and capturing rare events, but we are still storing these uh, frames in the storage and being able to annotate these frames with uh, uh, the collective variables, which serve as uh, metadata for searching and retrieving specific type of uh, trajectory, specific pieces of trajectory. That is very valuable. The other aspect that we can leverage is uh, uh, inside molecular dynamic trajectory is aspect of sampling uh, rather than creating a knowledge that is based on all the frames. What we look at is using this approach for what we call an enhanced adaptive sampling of the information sample when needed. And last but not least, the most ambitious goal is given this knowledge that is local and it is collected as the simulation evolves, can I steer on the fly my uh, search, uh, my molecular dynamic and jobs? Uh, can I stop some? Can I restart some? Can I fork some based on the type of phenomena and when we speak about phenomena, we speak about rare events that are occurring at runtime in my simulation. This is our big challenge. And we are moving the fourth step toward this vision. And we are applying that to uh, two main uh, molecular system with our collaborator at uh, Cornell University. The first one is about uh, applying uh, and using this workflow for uh, the study of the human dopamine transporter, which is an important component molecular structure for understanding and annotating the dynamics of human dopamine, dopamine uh, transporter. The other uh, molecular structure we are uh, targeting with our framework is the bovine beta lactose globin. It is important to study because of its structure, that open and closed loop in docking. Um, and this is particularly suitable for studying of enhanced adapting sampling. So these are two examples of what are uh, systems that are very important uh, today and are studied through molecular dynamic simulation and for which the use of our uh, in situ analytic uh, component allow us to extract information at runtime. We hope to be able to provide scientific discovery about these two uh, molecular systems very soon. Uh, we are currently running uh, 
our simulation. So I hope to be able to come back uh, to the uh, works community and to the community at large with updates on the scientific discovery that our uh, framework has enabled. So I want to uh, complete this presentation by looking at uh, the needs that I think are important uh, for the next generation molecular dynamic workflows. And I think that we can look at these needs and for the specific workflows that I've told you about today, but we can also generalize these needs for other type of workflows. So let's start by the fact that uh, we need to formulate and implement methods that are in situ and allow us to trace events in our workflows as they occur. In our case, we were looking at aspect of rare events. We were looking at aspect of capturing them through collective variables. Uh, in other simulation, the rare events can have a different meanings and their collected variable can be different in terms of statistic representation, but is a common starting point having in situ method for tracing the evolution of our simulation. The second important need is about the need for designing data representations that are perhaps not friendly for our eyes, but are more suitable for uh, machine learning techniques, and in our case, uh, unsupervised machine learning techniques. And so here we saw uh, a possible representation that went through a couple of steps and bring us to represent a frames, a molecular structure into a graph encoded representation. There are others. And so it's important to be able to um, abstract the representation so that in the representation, the new type of representation, we are able to embed anomalies, we are able to embed rare events and capture the features that are important and need to be identified through machine learning and uh, similar techniques. The last aspect is about uh, making our in-situ workflows, the management of our workflow more powerful so that uh, the uh, compute and the analytic, which can take place separately, take place indeed in concert together. And so it's not a trivial step because we have to think about aspect of coordination and uh, detection at runtime of event, uh, we need to identify um, aspect of detection of convergences in terms of local data that converge towards a local, a global vision. And then we need also to be able to manage uh, simulations, manage the job, uh, have important, efficient and effective sampling of the jobs so that the all uh, components, the combination of the different part work all together. Uh, enabling together the scientific discovery. I stop here and I will be very pleased to answer your question. Thank you.